and kind of shut down. Santa Barbara did get to hear a slightly updated version of this uh, in January, just before the shutdown for COVID. Um, the, the last talks were very focused on the history of the people that were making the initial discoveries of finding asteroids. I'm going to have to try and condense that quite a bit because what I want to show is how much has happened since the beginning of COVID. There's been a lot of discoveries, there's been a lot of space probes out there finding things, and that's what I want to focus on on this talk. But first, we still have to talk, we still have to go to the beginning. The uh, Kepler, when he was plotting out the planets, he came up with his uh, laws for uh, that the closer a planet it is to the sun, the faster it goes around, and there's a distinct ratio for that. He made this chart. He found there was a gap. There was something missing between Mars and Jupiter. People were thinking about it for the next 120 years, but it wasn't really serious until they found, also way out at the other end, was the planet Uranus, and guess what? It made that same series. So it became very obvious something was missing. So several astronomers got together and decided they're going to go looking. And they found it. It was Ceres, the planet Ceres. But something happened because it wasn't the only one. Within about 80 days, they found another one. And two years later, another one. And then two years after that, another one. What else was going on was when they were finding them, they weren't orbiting like planets. They were doing this weird thing, tilted up out of the plane of the planets. And the ellipses, instead of being just a little bit off like planets are, they were way up. So they found these. Herschel had one of the best telescopes. He was piling the power on. He kept looking at these little dots. That's all you see for these asteroids, is little dots. He could never see a disk. He said, these probably aren't planets, they're way too small. He suggested the word asteroids, and that stuck. Olbers, when he realized there's more than one, he thought maybe this is the fragments of a planet that exploded. And so he said, let's go looking for more. Next slide. So sure enough, they found a third one they called Juno, and Olbers himself found another one in 1807. Remember, that's three years in between. That's as long as we've been shut down for COVID. He gave this data to Gauss, who was a mathematical genius at the time, and could figure out the orbits for these very highly elliptical and very highly inclined orbits. And after several times, he's getting good at it. He can do it without a computer, just a pencil and paper, in about 10 hours. They gave Gauss the honor of naming this fourth one, he called it Vesta. Both of them have these very non-planet-like orbits. But he said, there's got to be more than four. So he said, let's keep searching. So he continued searching for eight years. He finally gave up. He just wasn't finding any more. So 15 years after that, one of his friends, uh, Friedrich Bissell, um, you might know him from mathematics if you work with vessel functions. He went around and said he's, he was doing good work. People, let's, let's look for more. Almost no one really was interested, except for an amateur, Carl, who's master of Dresden, Germany. So he started a search, his own search. He searched for 15 years, 15 long years. Finally, in 1845, while he was not looking for anything new, he was looking for a Vesta, he finds another asteroid that he calls number five, and it's named after the goddess of justice. He's found it's justice for 15 years of effort. Now, he kept looking, and two years later, he finds number six. And he thought, ah, there really are more of these out there. But it's 38 years since that original group that got together looking for asteroids. They're all gone, except one guy who was a youngster, the math genius, Scouts, and they gave him the rights to name this other asteroid number six, perhaps reminiscing of what he felt like when he was first finding asteroids. He calls it Hebe. 
the goddess of youth. You can go on to the next. Naomi Oster is often contentious. I'll step back here a so I can look at these also. So after uh, Ceres, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta, people are sort of saying, yeah, let's, let's just keep naming these after mythological female creatures. That didn't last very long because an Englishman found 12 and said, let's name it Victoria after my queen. And then another guy discovered 20, and he said, I like where I live. I'll just disguise it by saying in Greek, Marseille. But then the guy in 21 lived in Paris, so he just called it Latin. He gave it the Latin name for Paris, for 21. But no agreements ever worked very long. So we got uh, Bertha and Zella are named after a sister and a niece. Then you have Bettina, who's actually named after the Baroness Bettina von Rothschild. And that was because he sold the naming rights. He was trying to get enough money to go on an expedition to see a solar eclipse. How are you going to get to Texas? <laughs> then uh, 482 Bettina and Sabina were named after Max Wolf's dogs. <laughs> But then maybe he has a right to. He found 248 asteroids. He's running out of names. They just started to get a little political. We got a, a Lenin, a Tito, a Karl Marx. People started saying, we gotta stop, we gotta get organized. Next slide. So they got a committee and said, nobody's gonna name anything unless we okay it. And right away, anything political or military, that has to be gone for a hundred years before we had to think about naming it. But that left a lot of artists. So we have things named for Bach, for Beethoven, and that's 1814 and 1815. I looked, I really thought that this would be true. 1812 is not named for Tchaikovsky. We also have some modern artists, like Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and uh, Starr. Eric Clapton got in there. Then we have in the, I want to call it imaginary, called literary characters that people love, like Bilbo Baggins, Mr. Spock. And of course, 907 has to be James Bond. Does anybody remember who Arthur Dent is? The reluctant hitchhiker to the galaxy. Okay, there's also a very good tradition, and that is that we try to honor those amateur astronomers and educators. Like, for instance, Joel Metcalf found 41 asteroids, so he had two of them named after him. Joella Metcalf. Uh, we also have a comet discoverer. He got a comet named after him, but the two I want to focus on are in our local area, and they're here and now. There's Brad Pencala. He's a, a junior high school teacher up in the Santa Barbara area. And we have our own Al Jandor. We go on to the next one. I got interested in doing the um, asteroids about around 2015, kind of by accident. I noticed they started showing up in some of my pictures. My pictures weren't very good. I was just setting uh, a very early digital camera up on a tripod. But by the time that the paper, the recipient talk I did in September 2019, I had found about 245 on, on photos. Now today, versus a few, a few days ago, I'm up to 978 of the first 1,002. Why 1,002? Well, when I photographed 1,000, I didn't know that galaxy was going to be there. It doesn't look great. When I photographed 1000, I looked it up and I realized, oh, this is part of a trio. So they finally got their names up in the sky. The two, the three guys that really started it all off got 1000, 1001, and 1002. So I had to add those to my bucket. What I also like to take pictures of are earth grazers. These are asteroids that are menacingly close. They're usually smaller, but they're coming in close to the Earth. This one was from 2002, and this asteroid got within about two and a half miles. It's a big one, it's about a kilometer across. 
I just happened to catch another main belt asteroid. So this one's about two and a half million light years, uh, not light years, two and a half million miles away. That one's about 270 million miles away, out of the main asteroid belt. The way I got that dotted line is I was taking a 30 second exposure, waiting 30 seconds, getting another 30 second exposure. So you can see how far that asteroid went in one hour. I want you to pay attention a little bit to the fact that we call this a one kilometer, a one kilometer wide asteroid. This comes up later. Really what I want to do, one of my goals is I want to find Hal's asteroid. So anybody who wants to join me, it'll be on the night here of January 6, 2008, between 12 and 1 in the morning. It will be just barely above 19th magnitude, as anybody knows the magnitude scales. <laughs> it'll be almost overhead, but there will be a moon up, about 75% of the moon. But the moon will be about six degrees away. What do you think the chances are when you catch this? <laughs> You'd be surprised. I've got down to 17 with a four inch telescope before. Next slide. Now, you can see from my pictures and, and in many other pictures professional, asteroids from the Earth just look like dots. How do we know anything about them? Well, they move. So those move, those that moving around, if you have enough observations, you can calculate their orbit. And when you do that, you start finding that they bunch up. In fact, the biggest bunch represented by these white dots is called the asteroid belt, or the main belt, and it lies between Mars and Jupiter. But Jupiter disturbs things a lot out there, and it sets up these kind of resonances. One of the most interesting ones is um, happens to the Hildas, perhaps we should have a better pointer. The Hildas here, and the orange, show up here, and they avoid Jupiter. They do it in a strange way. Every time they swing out away from the sun, they stay away from Jupiter, so they either come here, or here, or there. You also have the uh, Trojans. Now, broadly they're named the Trojans for everything, but in fact they break it down ahead of Jupiter are the Greeks, Behind Jupiter are the Trojans. Of course, this is from uh, the Trojan War. So a lot of these guys are named after uh, Trojan or Greek heroes. But in fact, there's a spy. In each group, there is a Greek in the Trojans, and there's a Trojan in the Greeks. That's because they had this head how to name them until after they started naming them. But they didn't change the names of the one they had. There's also a group of the ones that we really worry about. You look in here, there's not a whole lot of asteroids, but the ones that are there are kind of dangerous. These are the ones that get close to the Earth. You have the Atiras, their orbit is all inside the Earth's orbit. You have the Atens, they have an orbit that's mostly inside the Earth's orbit, but sometimes crosses. Then you have the Apollos. Their orbit is mostly outside, but still crosses the Earth's orbit. And finally, you have the Amors, which is, they come close to the Earth, but they never actually cross its orbit. Sometimes the, the representations of things on the screens just really destroy the scale of what's really going on. Does this look crowded to you? There's a lot of dots there. What you don't see is even on this scale, Jupiter is way too large. These dots are infinitesimal on this scale. No, R2D2 is wrong. Going into an asteroid belt is not a bad thing to do. In fact, the typical distance between asteroids and our, and our asteroid belt is two million miles from one asteroid to the next. It's a lot of space out there. If Han Solo was trying to hide in our asteroid belt, he's in trouble. He would have trouble even knowing he was in an asteroid belt. Next slide. The other thing we can do with a little tiny bit of light, we take the spectrum. So there's three major types 
uh, asteroids. They've actually really improved things, and they've broken that down to 167. I'm not going to go into that. There are three major types of asteroids. You have these that are mostly a carbon. Think of like a lump of coal, or at least the surface has a lot of carbon on them. They're very dark. They have ones that are a little bit bright, uh, brighter. They're called stonies. They have a lot of silicate material in them. And finally, there's a smaller portion that are a lot of metal. There's a lot of iron and nickel, and they tend to be a little brighter, but also tend to be a little smaller. Also, we can examine that light over time, we'll see it flickers. And that's because almost all of these asteroids are spinning. Some of them spin extremely fast. There's one we know goes around in 10 minutes. This came up just last week. Our data, especially since the Gaia spacecraft, for the positions and velocities of these asteroids is becoming so good that there are some physicists that are, that are looking at just the dynamics of the asteroid group as a whole, trying to find out, is there any dark matter that's actually flowing around inside our solar system? All this from just how bright they are and how they what's the color. We've got a couple of new types that have popped up in the last few years. Um, one is we have interstellar visitors. Uh, a few years ago, 2007, was Oumuamua, which of course was discovered by one of the observatories in Hawaii. Then we have uh, 2i Borisov. It was definitely an asteroid, I mean a, a comet, not an asteroid, but it was definitely also from interstellar space. It wasn't something that came from within our solar system. They didn't think they'd see very many of them after seeing Oumuamua, and yet there was one two years later. There's also, if you've been reading anything about astronomy lately, there's been some articles about, oh, the Earth has extra moons. It has these pseudo-moons. Well, in fact, it doesn't have two, like the article was saying. I dug into it. There's actually seven right now. Now, they're not, they're not real moons in the sense that they're going around the Earth. What happens is they're going around the sun but the oval that they're going around is rocking up and down like this, such that if you were just standing on the sun, I mean on the earth, and you didn't know about the sun, you'd think, hey, that's going around me. But it's not. It's going around the sun, and it happens to be co-orbiting with the earth. They're not extremely stable orbits. This top one, though, that I have there, it's actually mapped over here. They figure that's been up there for at least a few centuries and we've been good for a few centuries more. But they have found others in this list and they come and go. Asteroids come in, they play around and dance with the Earth for a little while and then they leave. When the Galileo uh, spacecraft was on its way to Jupiter, on its way there, through the main asteroid belt, it took a picture of 51 Gaspar. And this is important. It took a picture of 243 Ida. What's interesting about 233 Ida, it's the first asteroid that we noticed has a moon. People thought this would be rare, maybe 1% of asteroids. It turns out, as we we're studying more and more asteroids, something like on the order of 15 to 20% of them have these little asteroids or more they're following them around also. So of course, if you're going to try and block an asteroid, maybe you're going to have to block more than one. Then, there is this one. That was just in passing. Galileo was on his way to do something more important, just to kind of picture these guys. This, in 1997, the NEAR was sent out, and it was really supposed to look at asteroids. So it went for near-Earth orbits again. Not something far out in the asteroid, something that might hurt us. And it went around this asteroid, then went out another, what is that, three years to come out to Eros. And it actually went into orbit around it. And then finally, what it did, even though it wasn't meant to be a lander, they said, let's do something else with this. And they made a controlled landing. It just 
is let it sit down on the surface. So they showed that we could reach them, we could get to them, but it's just sitting there on the surface now. If someone goes there, they could collect it. Um, I don't know if people are any other science fiction, so if anybody's uh, looked at the expanse on television, you might remember an episode called the Eros Incident. And people just lived inside tunnels of Eros, and somehow something happened and it crashed into Venus. And if we're more worried about the Earth, Eros is the first of the Neos. The reason it's important, uh, I'm sorry, near Earth objects, it's actually more of a Mars grazer. It comes much closer to Mars than it comes to the Earth. But because Mars is out there and perturbing it, there's always a chance that it's going to disturb its orbit and it will become a Earth uh, grazer, not a Mars grazer. It's an next one. What's better than going out and looking? No, go out and touch. The Japanese, in 2005, set up a spacecraft space called Hayabusa, means uh, Peregrine Falcon. And it touched down very lightly on this rubble pile, the top picture up there, Iakawa. It's a very loose bunch of rubble, and they gather just enough dust that they could bring it back to Earth and we could examine it. Now, when it got to Earth, it dropped those off in a parachuted return capsule and then burnt up in the atmosphere. They studied that sample. They're finding olivine and proxerine, kind of things you could find on the Earth, but also trace bits of organics and water. Now, I'm not saying life, but organic chemicals. They were so thrilled with what they did, they made one that was almost, but not quite identical, and sent it out. And in 2018, it goes around Raigu. And it orbited it several times. It actually had landers. It jumped off these little boxes that floated down to the surface, and they were spring-loaded. So the box would land, and the spring would go off. They could hop around the surface. You don't want to make them hop too high. These are asteroids. It could just float away. But they showed that there were so many boulders, they had to be very careful about where they're going to put this lander down. Finally, they picked a spot, it went down, and it gathered some surface soil. But they wanted to do better than that. So they lowered a box with basically a gun in it that has a big bullet, an impactor. And they're going to fire it at Raigu, but they're not going to stand around and wait for things to happen. The spacecraft lowers it somewhere nearby and then goes over and hides on the other side because it fires that bullet, it made a 30-foot crater. So then the spacecraft went back around to get more pristine samples that haven't been degraded by being exposed to space for so long. It wrapped from the center of that. It brought those back to Earth in December 22. In other words, just a few months ago. And they've already discovered that there are trace amounts of uracil, which is part of RNA. They've also found, interestingly, niacin, vitamin B3. Anyway, it shows there are some interesting organics that are built into these asteroids. Some people worry maybe they brought life to the Earth. Now, this probe isn't like the first one. They didn't let it burn up in the atmosphere. It actually continued on, and it's going to visit two more asteroids, one in 2026 and another one in 2021. And if you want to have some fun, go on the internet and look for a picture of Raigu that Brian May, uh, Brian May, the uh, lead guitarist for Queen, is also an astrophysicist. And he and Freddie Mercury both have asteroids named after them. But he created a stereo image so you get your glasses that are blue and green and put them on, and you can see this rotating three dimensional sphere floating in space. It's pretty interesting. Next. Now, the United States, of course, also has been doing the space probes. And one particular big one was the Dawn spacecraft. The Dawn spacecraft has a rather large um, ion engines. This was sent off to the distant asteroid belt, the main belt. So it's spacecraft that went way out. It orbited Vesta 
for several weeks, took these great photos, a whole series of them. This is a pretty tortured looking surface. And it also did that the largest asteroid, the first one that was found, Ceres, and it's much rounder. People were worried that maybe these bright spots were actually the city lights of some alien civilization on the surface. Nah, it's much more likely it's salt. There's actually a lot of water on the Ceres, but water cannot exist at the surface. So it's sort of percolating up evaporating away, whatever salt it's bringing is coating the surface. And this is my most recent picture of uh, Ceres from just uh, a few weeks ago. It was going through the Virgo Galaxy Cluster and it was right next to uh, M100. That's a, a spiral galaxy. Next picture. So, not to be outdone by the Japanese, actually we're collaborating with this. They get some, we got some of their samples, we're going to give them some of ours. It's called OSIRIS-REx and it's on a mission to the moon. I want to look at the time scan because people think, oh, there's something coming, let's rock, launch a rocket and we'll go blow it up. The average time from the time that you say, let's make a mission and get it to a near-Earth asteroid is four years. So let's look at the timeline. It left Earth. 2016. It arrived on Bennu 2018 December, more than two years. Once it arrived there, it performed a long orbiting survey trying to select the best site to drop down and take a sample. It did three of her rehearsals, each time going down closer to the surface. Just make sure we got to get this right. We can only do it once. Well, maybe. Now the sample's been gathered back in October. And it's on its way back to the Earth right now. It's going to drop those samples off on September 24th, probably somewhere in Utah. But again, like the last spacecraft that uh, the Japanese sent, it's going to continue on. We're going to go and make another rendezvous with uh, one called Apophis. Apophis is a scary piece of rock. When it was first discovered, the calculation said, oh, this has a 2 or 3% chance of actually hitting the Earth. That cost a lot of attention. A lot of people started making more measurements and observing it more. And fortunately, the numbers got better. Now we can say with good confidence, it's not going to hit us for at least 100 years. When it last came around, I was ready. This is that little streak. It's Apophis right here. Now, there is an Earth satellite going along here, but they're not close. For this uh, close approach, Apophis was not coming down close to the Earth. However, on April 13th, 2029, it's going to be closer than our geosynchronous satellites. It's going to be underneath those. If you're in a dark sky and you're watching, it's going to look like about a third magnitude star. It's going to be traveling about 40 degrees an hour across the sky. You can look up and go, it missed us. <laughs> it's big, it's scary. If you compare it to the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building, that's what it looks like. This is not a little 140. This would be huge compared to what I dropped on Santa Monica Bay. Uh, in case you're wondering, Dinu is an Egyptian mythological bird, Osiris is an Egyptian god of the dead, and Apophis is an Egyptian god of destruction. And I think maybe these guys are like into Stargate, man, but they're just trying to choose things. And the Dawn is a very important mission because it was the first demonstration of a real technological protection against asteroids. We were going to hit a small moon and change its orbit around one of the larger asteroids. Remember, moons became important to us. It makes it very easy to calculate how much, you've, how much energy you've released if you can measure that change in the uh, period of a moon going around a little bit. The models seem to show that when this uh, spacecraft rammed into the uh, asteroid, that's about a 1,200 pound uh, spacecraft, and it was traveling about 
45,000 miles an hour. We expected maybe a 10 minute difference in the orbit. We actually found about 33 minutes. It was much larger than we were hoping for. And we think what happened is that there was a recoil of about 2 million pounds of rock where that hit, it wasn't like hitting bubblegum or clay and sticking and just traveling along with it. It hit and sprayed along the material back. And that spraying material back is what did most of the uh, change in the orbit. The, uh, Hubble Space Telescope was watching this. So on um, two hours after the impact, you can say there's just a lot of dust. And a, a little bit less than two days, you start seeing these streamers where as the uh, asteroid that's been hit is still orbiting, it's spraying this stuff out. And then what happened was interesting. After about 12 days, it started to look like a comet. All of that material being streamed out was being pushed away by the solar wind and the radiation pressure from the sun. But overall, this was a great result. So maybe now we can protect ourselves, but what can we do, excuse me, to make asteroids useful? Well, a one kilometer uh, nickel iron asteroid probably has about a billion tons of nickel and then another seven billion tons of iron in it. So you got lots of building material. Short term. Mm, you're thinking astronomy in terms of short terms, decades. You can think of these as like cosmic Costco or Home Depot. You go out and you gather things from them. For instance, uh, some of the asteroids appear to have a lot of concentrations of the platinum group of elements. Ooh, platinum. That's something that we can get rich with. It might contain as much as $10 billion worth of those, and it might take you only $1 billion worth to get there. However, okay, let's don't come all the way back to Earth, but come back a little ways. Those three spacecraft that went out there cost about $2 billion. So far, they've returned about two ounces of material. So there's a lot of work to be done in order to figure out how to get this stuff back to us where it's useful. How do you proceed? Well, are you going to bring all that raw material back to Earth? Nah. Maybe you can manufacture it in space, but if you're going to bring everything up from the Earth to build a factory, it doesn't work too well either. What about we process on site? So you park on the asteroid, and you, you do some manufacturing there, and you bring it back with the fuel that you make from the water. That sounds a little bit better. One of the things that's being planned a lot is what about we just go out there and tow one into the park it around the moon or around the earth, and then you can go out there and kind of work on it at your leisure. How about a really longer view, hundreds of years? Well, then you get to space elevators. You really have to make it cheap to get up into space. Most of the cost and most of the energy of getting into space is just up to like geosynchronous work. That's where the lion's share of the cost is. But do people know what I'm talking about with space elevators and space tethers? And some, some people, they've been in science fiction for a while. It's basically, you park something that you have synchronous for it, you drop down a rope, and you let things climb up the rope. Now, it's got to be a very strong rope. It's got to be counterbalanced at the top. But it's becoming feasible. So it's a very, very high upfront cost to set these up, but it's extremely cheap, relatively wise, to get things in onto the Earth and up into space once you have these. You can set up uh, asteroid factories using robots, and they could use 3D printers, and they could start making copies of themselves, and then they can do the mining for you. How about, and I've heard this a few times, uh, when the next time a more mora comes through, we're going to go out there and grab it. We're going to turn it into a colony. We're going to hollow it out. We're going to ride it on up to the stars. Well, the trouble with that is there's no way predicting where it's going to come in from and where it's going to go out to. Yeah, there's it traveling extremely fast, 190,000 miles an hour from a more mora. Kind of hard and expensive to catch. Now we're talking way out in the future. But if 
humanity wants to survive to win a few churches. Thank you.